Good evening and welcome everybody to this evening's event uh, from the Jesus College Intellectual Forum. My name is Julian Huppert, I'm the director of the Intellectual Forum here um, and our aim is to get people to think and talk about interesting things and to have fun as they do and tonight's event is going to be very much part of that. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to Jesus College before or if you're online maybe you still haven't been here, you're very very welcome. It has an amazing history, I won't tell you all of it, but it starts off in 1144 when the then Bishop of Ely gave a small plot of land to some itinerant nuns to settle on. Um, more land came from the King of Scotland, and don't ask quite why the King of Scotland owned this bit of land. Um, and then in 1496, the Bishop of Ely at the time came to see how things were going, and he reported that there were two nuns left. One of them was very elderly, and the other was of ill fame which you can interpret however you'd like. Um, so he got rid of all the women and turned it into an all-male college, a mistake we have since fixed. Um, but there have been amazing alumni who have been here who have really transformed so many aspects of the world. People like Archbishop Cranmer, who was obviously quite important in religion, uh, Thomas Malthus, Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Uh, we could talk about Lisa Jardine, who was an amazing Renaissance English specialist, but also was made a fellow of the Royal Society for her work on the Human Fertilization Embryology Authority. Uh, Belinda Wilkes, who, who ran one of NASA's deep space uh, X-ray observatories. The band Clean Bandit. Does anybody know Clean Bandit, Rockabye? Yes, good. I'm glad people are getting there. If you don't, you really should listen. They've had well over a billion listens, and they were a band that formed here at Jesus College. So there are, there are many more. Um, over the last six years or so, we in the Inter Intellectual Forum have tried to reach out beyond the boundaries of our college, the gates that surround us, and to try to reach a much more global audience. Um, I don't know exactly where you're from online, but we've had about 130 different countries uh, have people attend, so maybe we'll, we'll edge that up a bit uh, today. And to get people to think about more interdisciplinary things, how we combine different subjects, become more creative, and do much more on that. And so it's very much in that vein that I'm really delighted to have a stellar speaker tonight. Not just a, a speaker, but a creator and a facilitator who will help all of us to draw. And I, I think if, if she can get me to do anything creative, then she's doing a phenomenal job. Uh, so Melissa Pierce-Murray has an amazing track record. She did the obvious uh, combination of subjects when she was an undergraduate of English and physics, which is what everybody does as a, as a pair of degrees, and has continued um, doing sculpture in many places. And they are really spectacular. You'll get to see some of it later. Um, uh, various different awards, was a creative artist in residence, I think, at University College in Oxford, um, and has done so, so much more. So it's really wonderful to have Melissa with us. Melissa's going to talk for a bit, and then there'll be, I think, a bit of question and discussion, and then the workshop, and I'll, we'll explain then how those of you online can take part. Melissa, thank you so much for being with us. It's great to have you here. Over to you. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Hello, it's um, great to be here. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, so let's see, I'm just a few words about myself. Um, I'm originally from Colorado, but I've lived in the UK for pretty much over half my life now. So um, it hasn't taken off the edge from my accent. Um, my work draws widely from many subjects and I'm going to be just talking a little bit about interdisciplinary work. Um, but as an art, and this is a talk, as an artist, um, I think a lot about what appeals, uh, what attracts interest, um, and that can be visual or conceptual. And so, um, so this talk is on aesthetics, and I'm, I'm look, going to look at senses, perception, narratives, culture, power, politics, rules, value, utility, there's a lot to say. And I'm going to use examples from my own and from other artists' work to, to show uh, how art and artists might um, address these topics and ideas. Um, so aesthetics is defined as uh, principles concerned with the nature and appreciation of beauty. And I'm going to start with this concept of beauty. But what is beauty? What are the qualities of things we might describe as beautiful? Is it an appearance, is it something superficial, uh, a trivial or inconsequential quality? Does beauty beguile? Does it dissimulate? Does it mask? Or is beauty a fundamental essence, revealing truth? Often qualities of beauty are aligned with qualities of enlightenment, illumination, transcendence, 
and certainly in the Western tradition. So it, it does beauty and guide or inspire our interests, our scholarly or creative endeavors? And if so, in which ways? And then if we consider what beauty is in relation to particular subject areas, painting, chemistry, poetry, sculpture, physics, dance, we can immediately understand that the qualities and relevance of the concept of beauty will be varied and specific to each individual discipline. And furthermore, different cultures and different epochs, um, Japanese, European, East African, they all have different concepts of beauty, not to mention different morals and different truths. And I'm just having a little, there, okay, I, I have a Mac, this is not a Mac, I'm getting up to speed here. So from the outset, we can see that there's something a bit problematic and arbitrary about the notion of beauty. However, most people uh, and cultures now and in the past would find an exquisitely balanced, highly polished blade-like piece of jade like this quite beautiful and desirable. Um, if anybody would like to join me on a heist at the British Museum to collect some of these, you can get in touch after the talk. Um, this prehistoric hand axe was found near Canterbury and it puzzled archaeologists. There are a few sources for jade in China and Central America, but certainly not in Britain. There are, however, a few European sources for jade, and in 2003, archaeologists found the origin of this stone, and in fact, thanks to imaginative research and carbon dating, they found high in the Italian Alps the precise boulder from which this stone was flaked. This axe was obviously not made for cutting, it's too fine to be useful. It was made for aesthetic pleasure. So 6,000 years ago, it would have been an expensive, exotic luxury item, possibly traded through France and then arriving in England as an object of ceremony or a ritual. It was likely a status symbol, indicating its owner's power and prestige. Smooth, sleek, expensive objects of prestige, status, and power. Mine's not. It's a cruddy old one, but smartphones give us the almost magical ability to talk to people across time zones and distance, and an ability to anonymously broadcast provoking information. It's the power to instantly find out anything, a recipe you might want to cook, or a song you want to hear, or where you are, and where others are, and when they're there, and for exactly how long. It's increasingly problematic and kind of creepy. These alluring, Objects neatly package the advantages of connection, entertainment, information, and ease with the problematic seductions of the virtual world, social media, and they open up a world of surveillance and social control. Beauty and aesthetics are never far from power and politics. In 2019 through 20, I was visitor in the creative arts at University College Oxford, and I lived and worked in the college, interacting daily with people through workshops and conversations, and installing and moving artworks of different sizes around the college, in the libraries or in the common rooms or on the lawns or on the walls. Um, during my time at UNIF, I tried to challenge preconceptions of what art is and to demonstrate ways in which artistic activity can be used. And often I used humor and participation to involve people and start conversations. So at the beginning, I did a workshop with students in the, in the student um, uh, bar, and uh, it, we were drawing skulls using black ink and, and talking about the tradi tradition of Day of the Dead. And uh, so we decorated these schools, made flowers, and some of these found their way into formal hall up by the portraits. So academics, um, like many of us working on something, are focused individuals who probably, possibly not have had much time to think about art. And if asked what good art is, they might, for example, describe perceptively observed representational paintings. Um, these ancient and historic academic institutions can harbor some comparatively conservative taste, obviously not Jesus College, but uh, a beauty. But there's a good reason for this. We, we have to uphold and reinforce traditions in order to extend them and to build upon them. So there's a, there's a give and take with that. Oh, oh, oh. Hold on, we just, let me just go back. So. Right, right there. So, um, what is beauty? Um, beauty is a feature of objects that makes them pleasurable to perceive. And the pleasure might be biologically innate behavior. As be bees, we notice the pattern and balance of the eyes. And our mouths help us inform us what food is good or bad for us. And lots of pleasure is biologically related to sexual reproduction. 
And an aesthetic is concerned with beauty or the appreciation of beauty. And this is an expression of learned behavior, such as actions or gestures or rituals that we imitate. And they reflect cultural values, the things that we pay attention to and the hierarchy of importance that we place on things. The word aesthetics comes from the Greek, I perceive, I feel, I sense. And ancient writers meant by the word a responsiveness to the stimulation of the senses. Um, but in the 1700s, in, in uh, the Europe, the German philosopher Baumgarten changed the meaning of the word to mean taste or sense of beauty, and aligning this with good or bad art. Uh, in part, this was a, a response to increasing wealth due to colonial activities and a class of people wanting to purchase and display art. He tried to make a science of aesthetic and to duck the rules or principles of this beauty. He invented this trio of good, truth, and beauty. Kant countered that aesthetic judgment is subjective. It's not possible to quantify it objectively. And Tolstoy asserted that good truth and beauty have nothing in common with each other and they may oppose each other. Um, so, ah, I've lost my... Ah. Right, sorry, technical problems. Oh, now, okay. Right, let's go back here. So, that's not quite where I wanted to be, but anyhow, we'll start. Maybe I should use a clicker. Sorry. Okay. Okay. How do I go down like this? Down, down. Right. Okay. Right. So what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about this piece here, um, and I have to keep a little bit more to the words here, otherwise I might go off on big tangents. So um, I might say that. Okay. So I wanted to talk about the aesthetic, the noun. So especially as, that, as it's used in the context of art, um, is something different. So when we speak of the aesthetic, we refer to a set of principles or techniques that underlie a work of a particular artist or an artistic movement. So hence, I might say I use a rough aesthetic often. Um, this piece um, incorporates elements for me in, of drawing the black inky line performance. It's actually two two pieces, and to put it together, people aim and lift and and, and point the spikes at each other and carefully position themselves together. Um, and also interdisciplinary, it pulls together ideas, uh, elements of, of literature and geophysics. So it was one of the first pieces that I presented at UNIF um, at the beginning of my stay there. But people are busy, uh, busily preoccupied with their own ideas and they might just walk by with a, scarcely a glance. And so I wanted to try something a little bit more engaging. Okay, so this is the view from my room where I lived in college. And from here, I could watch students heading to lectures at lunch, academics conversing or musing. And looking down at this square, it appeared to me like a blank canvas full of potential, just per perfect for me to 
plot and hatch plans. So I use the uh, chalk drawn lines of hopscotch tango as a playful and engaging way to introduce ideas that I wanted to work with people in college. So ideas of drawing, of performance, of interdisciplinary interactions. The hopscotch patterns trace numbers relating to Pascal's triangle on one end and to the sonnet rhyme scheme of Ozymandias on the other. And towards the center of the walkway, the footsteps lay out the patterns of the dance uh, tango. Set in the context of one of the world's oldest educational establishment, hopscotch tango was playfully pointing to the interrelations between games and competition, between historical context and new narratives, sets and structures, boundaries and innovation, and the differing values and perspectives of arts, science, and academia. Um, so for the first formal hall, the first dinner of the year, I added curious objects to the long, elegantly set tables, linear objects constructed from wood, wire, and paper. And on each painted paper circle, I asked the question, what is drawing? And it turns out that that's a very interesting question to ask people and leads to all sorts of discussion. So you might just think for yourself, what is drawing? What, what do you think is drawing? And we'll, we'll get back to this later on. Is drawing about looking? What is looking? Is it about representing what you see? Or is it about the experience of what you perceive? Does the drawing have to be recognizable to be good? What do we mean by good? What is the activity? What materials can you use? Do you have to use pencil and paper? Is it about perception? Do you draw something differently if you know what it is? What isn't a drawing? Is this a drawing? Many people, artists including, say, I can't draw. A painter said, we see patches of light, dark, and color. It's all about tone. Well, I'm a sculptor. I see outlines. Do you have to use your eyes to draw, can you draw by touch, by sound? Um, so people have been thinking about questions like this for a long time, and so I've got some examples of artists thinking about this in the 60s and 70s, which is an interesting time to go back to, and we will bring this up to date as well, uh, to think about how technology has enabled us to access new understanding. Um, Rebecca Horn, the artist Rebecca Horn on the right here, used, um, made body modifications. She attached objects and instruments to her body, taking as her theme the point of contact between a person and their environment. By being able to see what she was touching and the way in which she was touching it, it felt as if her fingers were extended and in her mind created the illusion that she was actually touching what her fingers, were, her extensions were touching. So we have the outer senses, the ears, eyes, nose, body, taste, and we can extend these senses uh, using microscopes, electron microscope, and lasers to see things smaller and smaller, um, but also using binoculars, telescopes, radio telescopes to see in immense distances. And we're also aware of other senses that we don't possess. Birds use magnetism to navigate. Butterflies sense color, not with their eyes, but with their entire body, and it allows them to change color to camouflage themselves. I mean, Academics might use data as another way of seeing. Um, but we also have what we might call inner senses. Um, the Brazilian artist, Lihia Clark, was interested in creating sensorial objects with the aim of dissolving the visual sense and heightening other bodily senses, touch, hearing, smell, things we aren't so consciously aware of but which profoundly affect us. And here we enter the realm of the brain, and the mind, and the consciousness. As sense perhaps of otherness or of spirituality. Um, there's a branch of science called neuroaesthetics. It's new, controversial. It's an area of neuroscientific research. But it tries to better understand how the brain responds to art. And it appears that art arouses an extremely complex whole brain response that brings into play many usually disparate aspects of the mind. And we can begin to understand and even create models to express stimuli outside of our own senses. So here, photographer Greg Burroughs uses ultraviolet fluorescent photography to give us a hint of how flowers look to pollinators. The bee's vision helps uh, distinguishes between UV reflecting and UV absorbing parts of the flower. So it helps the bees navigate between petals and stamens and enables them to find the pollen. 
It's very useful to the bees and very beautiful to us. Would non-pollinated flowers look drab or even ugly to bees? So perception, again, is the process by which people become aware of objects and events in the external world. So we have the external stimulus, so it might be sound waves or electromagnetic radiation. Um, we have some mechanism for uh, sensing, um, you know, in our noses, our ears, our eyes. And then there's a kind of processing of the sensory input. Um, there's a both physical and also cognitive. Um, so the perception is not just about the passive receipt of these signals, but it's also shaped by the recipient's uh, learning, memory, expectation, and attention. And so it's really interesting to explore perception with people in drawing workshops. We do exercises such as drawing without looking at the page, drawing by touch, by sound, by texture. And very quickly, you can see how differently people experience the world. And we'll explore this um, more in the workshop after the talk. So um, they used to use this uh, homunculus. Uh, it's a map of the human body with enlarged features to demonstrate the amount of the brain that's uh, dedicated to sensory processing and motor functioning or sexual arousal. This one's a female homunculus. And as you can see, the eyes are large, but they're not really the largest feature. The tongue and uh, that which we learn through taste is important. But I reckon that by the size of the hands here, that a sculptor must be using the brain most efficiently. Um, so it makes sense to use all our senses. Um, every concept, every idea has its opposite. What is the opposite of beauty? By defining what something is, you automatically create a void, what it is not. But it's not simple. The opposite of beauty depends on how we're defining positive qualities. If beauty is truth, simplicity, and order, then its opposite is chaos, confusion, complexity. If beauty is balance, then its opposite is instability. Hume says that beauty in things exists in the mind which contemplates them. Beauty depends upon the narrative. It depends on the story we want to tell. Back, back. Um, so I, uh, again, at UNIV, I brought in white cast plaster bottles of various shapes and sizes for the academics to paint after dinner. And the challenge was twofold. First, to paint something on the bottle that related both to the object itself and to the academic's area of research. And the second challenge was to try and guess the meaning or contents of the other painted bottles. Uh, the word apothecary, deriving from ancient Greek, means repository or storehouse. These bottles which have, have tops which look as if they should twist open or dispense drops of liquid, but the caps don't turn. And instead of holding tinctures, each cast and painted object contains a story. Rather than a collection of medicine, these bottles represent a repository of different kinds of knowledge and experience. And they also indicate a set of values, a discipline-specific set of qualities, which indicate what we might call a beauty of concept, something that's apt, well done, and coherent within a self-defined set of rules. And I'm interested in these rules that we create and the narrative objects contain, and, and, and these vary from individual to individual and across disciplines. So last month I was running some workshops at the University of Leeds CDT in fluid, fluid dynamics. Um, I did some flow workshops where the researchers could use artistic media and processes to explore properties of fluid dynamics, such as turbulence and viscosity. And then I did a, 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 a thinking objects workshop, and I led participants through a process of creating sculptural objects re representing an aspect of their individual research. So, for example, this one down here on the bottom, it, it's uh, the, kind of the, represents the mysterious intricacies of water droplets. So just that moment uh, of when the water is dropping is what the researcher was studying. Working with artists and scientists across discipline boundaries helps um, helps them appreciate how they use different ways of investigation and understanding, as well as their different values and intentions. But we can also understand that different cultures um, will also have different concepts of beauty. And I, I, I didn't, I, I, I kind of was really intrigued by. Um, I originally wrote this talk. I was giving a conference in, in Spain at a talk on beauty and aesthetics and art literature and science. So, but because I was already looking at a different language, uh, different cultures, I, I started thinking, well, you know, what do, what, what do we find out in other 
What can I find out about what other people, uh, what other cultures might think about beauty? And there was one paper that I found that looked specifically at Western traditions and Eastern traditions. And one thing that I thought was quite interesting was that if we, in the, in the Western tradition, you always have like a painting and there's always kind of the relationship of the viewer to the eye and the other, the viewer to the subject. Whereas in Eastern tradition, they seem to have, like if you imagine a, a, a painting of Japanese watercolor painting, it, would be, it might be of mountains and clouds, and then just down the corner, a little, some humans kind of walking along. And it's much more about, the, the human is really much more part of this big world, and it seemed to be a kind of fundamental difference in how, how, how we perceive the world around us, if I explained that well. Um, so but what I did want to say, it so happens in contemporary art, um, at least in, 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 you know, certainly in Britain, it, and it varies also if you go to America or France, it's different, but visual beauty, beauty is a bit out of fashion, and in fact, there might even be a vogue for the anti-aesthetic, um, we're in an era of mass production and, and reproduction of, of objects is kind of, you know, it's, it's a lot easier than it used to be. Um, and so, and, and artistic concerns are less about aesthetic objects to adorn space like they were in the 1700s, but they're still very much about questions of value. Um, so there's a political artist um, who was a trained originally as a geographer, who I find very interesting, named Trevor Paglin, and he's interested in ideas like of mass surveillance, and the defense industry, and the hidden or clandestine forces that shape our societies. And one recent work he was exploring um, AI and human biases built into machine learning systems. And for example, he programmed computers. I mean, there are many programs like this that you can give them a couple keywords and they can generate an image from you for you. Um, but he was training algorithms to recognize psychoanalytic dream symbolism. So rather than normally like you know recognizing faces, doors, people, he was looking for open windows, balloons, scratches, um, and then and then um, that that is an image that the, um, the the AI generated. So his aim was kind of to show how the politics of recognition, who and what we look for, are built into these systems. So his approach um, in his work in general reveals there's always more to an image than what we see at first glance, and that these perceptions announce strong political and cultural meanings as well. Now, um, so remember, I was saying that in art we use the aesthetic used rather than an aesthetic work. Um, so the aesthetic, pleasing or displeasing, beautiful or repellent, it's, it's like a semantic tool or a physical utterance. It's a syllable that we can use to convey our thoughts. For example, I like distressed or ragged surfaces and I dislike glitz and polish. I find it more exciting to see the process, the grappling for meaning, than a slick and finished piece. Sometimes an unfinished or preparatory work allows us to read or connect better with what an artist is thinking. And I think it's interesting to, to consider where our thoughts are embodied. This is a sculpture um, I did uh, called Chain of Knowledge, and it's, I chained together an early lap, it was for a, a library exhibition. Um, so I chained together an early laptop computer with a battery now replaced by slats of rainforest hardwood with a Victorian edition of Fox's History of the Catholic Martyrs. So chain of knowledge, I was trying to draw parallels between the utility of these technologies and pointing to tr questions of truth and vulnerability in collections of information. New technologies, such as the development of the printing press in the 15th century and the computer and the internet and our own, enable the collection and dissemination of knowledge. In medieval libraries, books were chained to shelves to preserve the information, the collections of information together. And in our time, computers and smartphones um, well, they act for like portals or conduits for information which is freely available on the internet. Um, though highly influential, Fox's authority as a historian was questioned from the start, and similarly, the veracity of information found on the internet demands careful scrutiny. It's very current in our awareness now that this slippery sense of truthfulness, of meaning, and narrative. I participated last year in, a, in an exhibition raising awareness on modern slavery. I was researching supply chains and the links between human movement and natural resources. 
Um, and currently, I'm quite aware of uh, commodities and resources and the geopolitics of rare earth elements that are supposed to fuel our green transition. But I was going to just bring it to the studio a little bit and think about this. Where in the process, in, in my studio process, might beauty and aesthetics come in? So there, the study of a topic or something like if I was looking at um, rare earth elements, for example. No, this is just research. Um, but if I go in the studio, it, it, the materials, the medium um, that I choose, well, yes, I mean, I will want to work with certain materials for certain reason, reasons. Uh, this is part of my artistic vocabulary. Is it in the form what I can express? Well, yes, although certainly I don't always like what I find. The forms can be ugly and effective or appropriately unsettling. And they might say something I don't intend or don't want. Um, they are an active site of exploration. Many artists talk about this uh, process of thinking through making. Is there beauty in the intent? What discourse I want this to speak to? This is what I'm calling the beauty of concept. Does this piece speak elegantly to the conversation I want to engage with? And when I'm Speaking of beauty, of course, I'm not just thinking of how something looks. Uh, for me, as a sculptor, there's the visual form and contrast, but there's the texture, the heft, the spatial arrangement. There's the sounds, the smell. There's a physical or bodily response. And then there's this quality of aptness or appropriateness. Or Let's break it down a bit further. Here's one way that I work with a sculpture kit. I make sets of individual objects of various scales. and it might be plaster, steel, wood, wax, pla uh, plastics, glass, ice. I might be working with dancers or light. And you might view this as my vocabulary or perhaps as phrases or themes or like physical thoughts. And I can combine these in different ways as I think and muse in the studio. And sometimes I'll create a, in the studio a sort of self-coherent set of rules or criteria. And these could be physical or conceptuals. And then I'll work to create something that, that nicely solves or sits within these rules. And then I can turn these fragments of thought into different conversations. And these pieces, in turn, I can contribute to different conversations as I place them in various settings or contexts. So with the remaining slides, I'm just going to show you a few more examples of my work. Um, so I, there's a nice big space here. I thought about bringing in a big, awkward object. Um, you'll have to imagine it. Uh, designed through collaboration with dancers. Um, I mean, these large, dynamic sculptures, um, they really expand out and collapse down. And they can move, be moved and positioned in different ways. With this piece, I was defining physical spaces for bodies to inhabit and interact with, but also portraying an emotional territory of feelings and experiences. I exhibited the works in Wakefield Cathedral, where they were also presented in performance with dancers. Let's see if that goes. Try again. Um, the recent work I did, I was up in Wakefield again um, uh, this spring um, and created a piece called Falling and Rising, and it was an interactive sculptural space. Um, and I was using objects to create discussions around the question, what sort of spaces do we imagine and create? 
I was in residence there for a while and ran workshops with members of the public, including uh, people with people with peop um, disabilities and with asylum seekers. Um, I was thinking of s spaces, uh, and I was thinking of interior spaces, uh, how we feel inside, exterior spaces, such as the constructed or natural environment, and then virtual spaces or hybrid spaces. And for each of these, I created a different type of object. So the solids here for me are representing how the in interior, um, the structures are kind of harder to see there, but those are um, the exterior spaces. And then the tangles are the virtual spaces. And then during the art, there was an art walk event and people could come by and move these around and create different sculptures and talk about these ideas. During the COVID-19 lockdowns of 2020 and in advance of COP26, I was researching and developing works related to the element carbon and created a series of works from carbon-based materials in steel, wood, and graphite. Um, there were sculptures that might refer to forest, human habitations, architectural spaces, or nano-scale structures. And again, these were supposed to be interactive pieces that I could work with people to make. Uh, and they were designed as, as kind of reconstructable burning sculptures, so to make them burn them down, but then with the potential for building them again. Um, we didn't do that because we were in lockdown, so I did other things with that. So, um, But um, I just wanted to check the time. Just... Um, Point, I, I guess I won't read you so much more about this piece, but I, what I wanted to point out is that the outcomes of human activity are often poised between creativity and destruction. So when we talk about beauty, is it in the object? Is it in the concept? Materials have the ability to seduce or distract us from truths. And beautiful things and seductive arguments often ma uh, mask ugly realities. If we concentrate on the presentation, we might miss the realities of material production, limited resource and waste products, of context, slave labor and inequality, and of politics, maintaining and reinforcing power or control. In the absence of absolute values, beauty and co beauty of concept become absolutions to arbitrary sets of rules which we ourselves have constructed. So I thought I would kind of end it here and, and, and so with a question. I thought maybe with great beauty comes great responsibility, not to beguile, mislead, or distract, but to strive to be honest. That's it. Um, <laughs> um, very happy to take any thoughts, uh, ta uh, questions now, and then we'll move in a bit, um, not too long, onto the drawing workshop. Hello. Um, and, and if we can just use the microphone for the um, viewers at home. Hi. Um, thank you. That was really interesting. Is it on? Is it working? Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Um, I was just wondering in your the piece about the with the book and the computer mm. was that inspired by William Gibson's Agrippa? It oh what the heck no no um, but it was inspired it was it was actually there oh, who's what's his name there's a piece I think it was around Cambridge at one time and it was a big a bench, a book, and it had a ball and chain. And so I was talking with the librarian and I was like, well, I could make you something. But, uh, but she brought me in this book and she had this old laptop computer. And so it was, it was and, and then I got going on this, it, in that book, that Book of Martyrs, they, they have like images of the chained libraries. And I, so I was thinking about, about that. But I mean, but I think you're right that, uh, Especially now, there are just so many e images out there, and we just pilfer them. And in fact, I was just reading about AI, which now, as I said, you can get AI will just look at all the images that are out there and generate new images. And I thought, well, this is sort of an interesting turn of events because we created AI in a way to reduce our labor, but now the 
AI is using unpaid artist labor to generate its own images and getting credit for it. So, <laughs> so um, thank you. Mm. Okay. <laughs> thank you, and thank you so much for a really interesting talk. Um, I was so, um, yeah, encouraged by how you mentioned that beauty can sometimes obscure truths for us and that's something that I think about a lot with regards to the fashion industry and just how much yeah beautiful clothes obscure a hugely exploitative set of trading and working practices um, and I just wondered whether you could yeah touch at all on um, how what role beauty might have in helping people to engage with the truths and um, of the world, the, the kind of the justice issues of the world? Do you see any place for beauty and for art in kind of engaging people with that? And if so, how do you think we could actually, um, yeah, make that I accessible to um, people on the mm. scale that's needed in order to kind of mm. have that uh, shift in, in conscious that we, consciousness that we need to, to begin grappling with huge global issues like fast fashion on the environment. Mm. I was so inspired mm. by what you are doing and I wondered whether you could share okay. more of your wisdom on that. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, so I think I, as I said, um, I think, you know, contemporary art, certainly in, in Britain, people are really actually not very interested in beauty. They're, they're interested in, you know, just what you can what you can use art and objects to talk, what different issues you can talk about. And I think this, I mean, I, I think there's like this sense of whatever attracts you to something. As I say, if I'm talking with a biologist, they're going to find something very different than if I'm talking with a musician. And, and you know, it's got to do with taste. Um, it's got to do with appreciation. So um, like if you if you're a connoisseur of wine, then you get more and more interested in the intricacies. But if you, if you don't really ever drink it, then, you know, you, you wouldn't want to spend thousands of pounds on it. You know, you wouldn't really. So it's got to do with knowledge, with that habituation. In terms of, like, fashion, I think there, there is really a, a strong, um, people try to um, uh, encourage individuality and, and, and just sort of respectfulness. And I think, I think it's the more that we can have these conversations to just say, well, this is one, one way, but it's not that, I, I, I guess the, the thing about the, um, what we see on in social media um, or you know, the, on the net is that it kind of tends to bring all ideas together and like you just have to think in one way. So I think you know, the more we can encourage people to be anarchic and just like, you know, just throw away <laughs> Just whatever anybody else is thinking, and just think what you know. What do I like? Um, mm, but 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 one other thing I was going to mention is that there is research into like other animals' sense of aesthetics and beauty. I mean, it's again maybe a bit controversial, but there are there are birds, for example, called bowerbirds, which collect blue plastic and make this beautiful little nest and in fact they make all sorts of different nests and if you took that if I took those nests and I put them in a gallery I'd be like really pleased with myself because they look so beautiful and so varied and different they obviously have some sort of sense of aesthetics um whales have I think like hump I'm not sure if it's humpback whales they have a current riff that translate oh across the ocean and they seem to like go oh, pick up on it and change it as it's going along and so there's obviously it's a, it's a form of communication. It's a form of enjoyment, and um, and I, I and I think it's that responsiveness that's really interesting. More than saying this is what something ought to be, it's more about like, oh gosh, that makes me think of this, or what do you think about this thing? And it's about those conversations. I think there was one up here, and I'll bring in one question from online, and then mm. uh, if they're brief, we can fit one more in, and then we, want, we have the workshop okay. piece to get onto. Yeah. So. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm really interested in site-specific work um, mm -hmm. and, like, focusing in on using kind of private spaces, uh, illuminating them kind of in obscure ways for the public. Mm. Like, I... 
I'm really interested in using the bedroom as like a performance space. Mm -hmm. And um, in my flat, we're having a haunted house and it's gonna be this, this big performance. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I guess I'm curious about how to best um, go about engaging with space um, mm -hmm. when you're trying to create something that can have universal affect. Yeah. Um, so that that's kind of interesting for me. Like if I make an object, um, now I'll, I told you about how I see. Um, like I always, I always thought when when like if I if I take a photo, I've had to get better about photos. But if I take a photo of someone and I go like, oh, that's a great photo. They did a great pose, and I take a picture of them, and then I get it back, and it's like, oh, there's all this other stuff going on in the background, and. I, I wasn't seeing that because I was just looking at my my you know my my person there and and so I realized actually photographers when they see they must be like really composing and like painters looking at patches of light and dark and stuff like this and um, so you know in regards to create you know if I take if I have an object and I bring it to a space it totally changes its meaning uh, for example these pieces that I had the awkward objects. One of the time, I was going to display them over in the cathedral over the, um, over the summer, and I wanted to give people this idea that there was a space for them, that it wasn't just an object to look. And I thought, well, I thought I could use some chairs. And I thought, well, I could put some chairs. I could put them in like that and stuff like that. And I ended up like with three, because I like threes. And, and so I put them there. And somebody else came and said, you know, if you put three chairs in a cathedral, people are going to start thinking about the Trinity and stuff like that. And I'm like, oh, that's not what I meant at all. And so it's, it's like you really have to be very sensitive to the, everything that's going around there. or find ways to totally minimize it, make everything dark and illuminate this so people aren't, you know, so it's, 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 um, there are different ways of going about that, but it is very complex. Can I bring in a uh, question yes. that's come here? You, you, you'd mentioned about how you see things as a sculptor. Mm. So, so the question is, um, were you always a sculptor or did you become one? Ooh. Um, well, I've thought about that a whole lot, actually, because I took a very circuitous route to get to where I, where I am. Um, you know, had I found out that one could be a sculptor far earlier than I had, would I have just, like, dove right into it, or would I have still wanted to do everything? I like, um, I remember when I was young, I really liked Leonardo da Vinci. I liked that there was somebody who wrote, who thought as a scientist, who, who was a beautiful artist, and I, and I just kind of wanted to be everything. And it turns out that, you know, if you try and be everything, you never really get, like, deep, um, and you go very slowly, so um, I kind of balance that. So I, I, don't, I don't know, but I, it does feel like a very natural place that, um, that brings in all of the ways that I like to interact with the world. So we, we, we should move to yeah. the workshop. Okay. Was there a brief question that we can try and fit in? If we just get a mic very quickly, and then mm. we may then have to just chat, I'm afraid. Sorry. Yeah. It was just a, a question following on from the one online, really, mm. about uh, the living artists that have inspired you over the years. Um, <laughs> I'm really bad with pulling out names on a, on a hat like that. I'll get back to you on that one. Um, yeah, I, the other thing is that I can tend to, this is why I use notes, um, because um, I'll tend to think non-verbally a whole lot, and it, it kind of can be a little bit hard dredging the words out, <laughs> getting them there. So, um, uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't think about any artist at all right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, so let's move on to something that I can think about. Let's think about what is uh, about drawing. Um, so I, wa I told you that I wanted to, um, let's see, t talk, get back to this idea about what is drawing. And so I just wanted to get some feedback from you. Um, what, what is drawing? What, what is the activity of drawing? What does drawing entail? I'd love to hear what you, what you, you know, some ideas. Anybody want to volunteer or from uh, online as well? Okay, um, yes, okay, and I'll, you say it and I'll repeat it for, oh, or you can give her the microphone. You whiz over there and give her the microphone, okay. I was thinking looking, really looking, and then analyzing, hmm. and trying to get down that information on a something. 
piece of paper. Okay. Okay. It's in there. Um, using an object defined very broadly to make marks of some kind defined very broadly. Okay. So, so there's something about looking. There's something about using an object to make marks. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Interpreting, seeing what you see and making your version of what you see. Okay, so there's an uh, there's a there's an, a, a bit of interpretation in there. There's the uh, looking and then or seeing and then interpreting. Uh, mm -hmm. Making a visual mark from online. Okay, making a visual mark. Um, any any other ideas over here? No. Okay, so. Um, oh, yes, there's somebody up there. Thank you for your contributions. It's good to hear. I was just thinking about the idea of the well, of sort of drawing something out, so, so not, not creating something new, but maybe taking something away. Yes, okay. So drawing something out, taking, taking something away. Mm -hmm. Anonymous attendee, who's been quite a frequent commentator okay. here, says, connecting your body to a mark-making device. Okay. Yeah, okay. So um, it's, I, I think this is, oh, yeah, so another question actually is what, when we think about what the act of drawing is, you know, it, it, and you just might think of it for yourself, what immediately springs to mind? Are you thinking of particular, you know, are you thinking of pencil and paper? Do you think of other things? Um, any, anybody think of anything that's not pencil and paper, or <laughs> that you'd like to mention? No. Yes? Stick in the sand. Stick in the sand. Okay, yeah. Um, so um, there's a whole area of research uh, in contemporary drawing, and um, it, let's see. There's one fellow that I really like, Charles Knowles. See, I remembered somebody. Um, <laughs> um, he He's done things like, attach pencils to the boughs of trees and set up an easel. And so when the wind moves, the marks kind of record on the tree. So it's again, it's, it's a mark, and it's caused by some sort of action as really, well, he's kind of facilitated this. Another thing that he did was he attached a weather vane to his head and walked, followed it around London, you know, followed the, the wind around London. And he put a little GPS on him, and af afterwards he made a, a piece of paper and it just showed the path of his moving around. So in that case, what is the drawing? Is the drawing what he did going around? Is it, was it the walk? Or was the drawing the, um, the piece of paper there? There's another artist who took a block of ice and pushed it around Mexico City, I think, like this, and it was just melting. Now, is that a drawing? It, it's got a line. It's used a big, you know, if I take a big piece of chalk and move it around? Is it different than if I take a big piece of ice or move it around, you know? So um, they do things like, um, so if you think about drawing as kind of just a, an action or a line through space somehow, does it matter how we make, make that line? It's kind of an interesting, I mean, you know, we're, we can, I think some people would argue that we can define drawing however we like. Um, now, okay, we're going to explore this a little bit more. Um, so, if you can whip out your paper and pencil, and if you don't have some, we will spend a couple minutes um, handing some out. And if you are online, if you um, get yourself a paper, pencil, and perhaps a mirror, which might be useful. Um, so, here's paper, if you start handing that out, and here's uh, a drawing implement if you haven't got one. So, paper, pencil, okay, yes. I'm um, sorry. Oh, this is a bigger. I should. I should have taken a small. There, there, are, there are things by the side of okay. your. Yeah. Any, yeah. If you're if you're in the room, there are mostly t little tables by the side of your seat, unless you're in the front okay. row. Yeah. Just ro roll them out. Right. Up and over. Um, so, so. Just to get this started. The first thing we're going to do is 
drawing without looking. We're going to look at our hand and just take a really good look at your hand. Put your paper down someplace else in your pencil on your paper. Now you're going to draw your hand, but you're not going to look at the paper. So have your hand here and your paper there and just draw. Don't, don't look at the paper, don't even peek, and try and keep your pencil uh, or pen on the paper. And, and perhaps, um, do you need paper or pen? Pens. Where'd the pens go? Pens up there. Let's go get for them. Um, okay, so you're just trying to spend a couple moments, try just to match perhaps the, how you're looking at your hand, the motion of your eye looking at your hand with the mark that your other hand is making on the page. We're just going to do this for about a couple minutes here. The nice thing about making drawings without looking at the page is you can't possibly feel like you're a bad drawer because you weren't looking. Um, so. On the other hand, you might surprise yourself. You might turns out that you're, you're brilliant at looking. So uh, what I would really like to do is just share some of these. So um, it would be great if you would just hold up your paper and I can go and look at that and see. And then we're just going to discuss a little bit. Okay. Right. This is really nice. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, take a look at the work that people have done around you. You know what's really interesting is that quite a lot of people here have, have really, quite a lot of people have, cover, have, have followed the outline of the hand. They've, they've kind of done this swoop. Um, but not everybody. Some people have done, I mean, I didn't tell you how to draw. Y you know, some people have gone, like, they've gone cross country on their hand, and they've gone back and forth, you know, and found the contours. Some people have found details, wrinkles, rings, um, you know, drawn in all those crinkles, or the, the lines, okay? Um, so one, of the, one time when I was doing this, I found, you know, one person who was an engineer, and he had drawn a really perfect, wonderful, outline and it turns out that he said yeah I just you know I kind of like to kind of always go from here to there you know so and in some ways his drawing drew that there was another person she had kind of like you know like kind of fuzzed around on on uh, on her hand you know and just just very indistinctly you could barely see the marks and she said yeah I kind of like to I kind of like to feel out the situation and so it was kind of it kind of brought us into contact with how how we might approach finding out about the world a little bit. Okay, we're going to um, try, any, is there any, um, any, I don't know, I, I think we're also trying to, trying to connect with people from, uh, from at home, so uh, we might be able to get some images up here eventually. Um, but what we'll try now is, okay, all right. Right, so this next one we're going we're going to we're going to pair up. Okay, so if you, if you don't like pairing up, you don't have to do it this way. But I was going to suggest just because it's a lot of fun that we work in pairs, and um, we're drawing without looking again. So get yourself a new piece of paper. Sorry, did people take more than one piece of paper? I hope you were really sort of. I hope, I hope you did. Okay, what we're going to do? One person is going to be the model it, at home. If you're doing this and you're by yourself. You can use a mirror um, to look at yourself. You can um, you look at a picture, or you might just look at an object, OK? So right. Yeah, OK. So what I want you to do, 
before we get starting here, so one person's going to be the model, so try and stay a little bit still. The other person's going to be drawing. Can you draw everything except that person's nose? Okay, and again, try and keep your, your, your pencil on the paper, okay? And perhaps think a little bit about how you're moving. Don't worry about looking at the paper. Just, just start, start right in. Um, <laughs> chaotic with lots of people. Yes. So we'll be able to see. Uh, okay. 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 Okay, and if you haven't done so, maybe you want to change partners. Try the other way around. <laughs> That's a good question. How are you supposed to draw a face without the nose? Okay, if at home, if you haven't got another partner, uh, perhaps, try, try, perhaps try a different way. Perhaps try and be aware of the textures. Instead of drawing contours, try and think about the different textures that you encounter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's really those are excellent. So uh, that's great. Awesome. They're so wonderful. Actually, we should take a picture um, here. Can I? If everybody if everybody were to hold up their drawing and then I can take a picture, that'd be kind of cool. Okay. Except I can't really actually see the drawings. <laughs> They're really good. They're really, okay, there's that. There we go. <laughs> They're they're just so yeah, they're so so lovely. So I think um <laughs> that's good, okay. And can I see some pictures over here? Can you hold just hold them up and just take a look. Okay. No one yeah. sent any from online. Isn't it? Yeah. Okay. So. This is one, yes. Okay. Really wonderful. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Actually, the interesting thing there too is how you you were using these kind of like almost feathery touches, even though you were thinking the hours. Ah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of surprising, isn't it, how well you can 
get at, at sort of like actually can, making a circle, for example. Oh, wow. Isn't it fun? I love... Aren't they great? Aren't they wonderful? I love them. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. <laughs> yeah. They're so interesting. Okay. So if you are looking, um, let's take a look. Okay, hold them up so I can take a look. Yeah. It's really nice. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, right. I hope that you're getting a chance to take a look at other people's drawings here. And um, if at home, I hope that maybe that we'll be able to share some of these images with you in a minute. Um, what I was seeing, and I'd like it if you kind of contributed a little bit to this, but some of the things I was saying that, um, you know, where do you, where do you start when I say draw a face, you know? You start at the top, the side, eye, you know, and that's a, that's a really interesting thing. Why, why would you start at one point rather than the other? Do you start at the top and go down? Do you, do you kind of move around? Like, did you take your pencil off the paper and bring it back? Um, or do you find that some features get really larger than the other? Like, I saw some with really big oh. eyes. And then, and then kind of smaller, or, or the teeth got huge. Okay, it's it it, it kind of it kind of shows you where where your attention is ling lingering. Okay, we did another thing here when I said do everything but the nose. Well, then you know people said, well wait a minute, how do you, how do you not draw the nose? Where does the nose start? Where does it not? You know where it is? And then, and then it makes you kind of like focus on a different a different thing. Um, and so, so what I was trying to do with this drawing is, is, is um, concentrate on the act of looking and, and by doing that, kind of show you how there's, the, like some people, I was talking with one person over here who was doing outlines, but what they, rather than one circle like this, they did lots of little touches like this to make an outline. And, and it turns out eventually you can actually get quite good at doing circles that join up. You can do a whole figure and stuff like that. You can really exercise this. I think um, Rodin did mostly uh, all of his drawings. He just basically just look and drew. Um, and um, so, so something like this, I mean, it's just quite interesting to this, like, I guess it's both the sense of where, where you're, you know, where your hand on the, the, your drawing hand is figuring out where things are. And also, like, somehow when you start looking, like you're looking at eyes, and then you try and draw the chin, and suddenly the chin goes, like, way over here. Um, so there's a, there's a kind of a disconnect between these, these different senses that we've... Um, but also, here we've got probably some trying to respond a bit to the texture. You know, when we, you know, we can use... Some people's drawings were, were really light and delicate, others kind of more vigorous. So this is, um, and I think not too many people were kind of using tone, but you could have done. You, I mean, what is it, you know, what do we mean by drawing? Does that mean, like, I don't know, do we have to use the point? Can we use the side? Can we use more aggressive? Nobody thought to, like poke holes through the paper, but Cornelia Parker, uh, who is the artist, if you remember, took all the pieces of silver and steamrolled them, and then displayed the flat pieces of silver hanging. She actually would use like a hot poker and paper, and burn the drawing. And so you know, sometimes people are using this as a, a way of mark making. And if that seems a little bit uh, out there, consider that charcoal, which people do use a lot, is just burnt wood, you know, we do draw with, you know, kind of burnt wood. Um, yeah, so, so now this is interesting too, so like something like, you know, when, why, why are we drawing out, outlines, you know, is that something got to do with how, how we see things, you know, does it draw attention to the important features, if this one's drawing eyes and mouth very prominently, um, but why don't we focus on cheeks? Maybe the cheeks should be the really, you know, are the cheeks just kind of boring? Why, you know, if somebody's got a beard, what, you know, do, do we concentrate more on the, on the beard? So, um, 
yeah. I, I find these um, sometimes a lot more interesting than, than drawings. I find my drawings, when I draw them this way, are a lot more interesting. Both, um, I don't know, it somehow unlocks and may, it, it brings out different ways of looking, but also it brings out different marks. It gives me a different expression. And then having explored that, then I might sort of then try and hone in, think, okay, how can I bring that quality into my drawing uh, and, and, and use more of this expressive, this immediate sort of sense of just perceiving to draw. Okay. So there is another artist that does a lot of drawing by touch. And uh, in fact, he does, the, I mean, there's one, one thing that he would do is he'd get a plant and he'd put it in front of him and he'd have, okay, a plant there, he'd have a piece of paper underneath the, the, the um, table. So he'd be drawing, you know, like looking at something straight on and drawing with one hand underneath it. And then he had another piece of paper here. And as he was drawing, looking this way, he was trying to draw what the, what the plant looked like from that direction. So if you can imagine, like if you're looking at somebody straight on and trying to draw their profile while you're looking at them straight on. Now there's no reason that we can't actually do a pretty good job of that because you know we have good depth perception but it's a way of kind of really doing your mind in because it's, it's like doing two things at once what, what i want to try now is is actually drawing by touch so what i was going to suggest and you can close your eyes so you don't have to worry about anybody looking at you is that you actually just make a drawing touch your own face and try and and touch that if you're shy just do your ear or do your hand or something like that okay but let's just, let's just really try and respond to the sense of touch and link up the drawing and the touching, okay? So it's just closing your eyes, or if you don't want to close your eyes, then just, do, just discreetly do your ear and, and feel the textures and draw what you're feeling. Just to put you at ease, I'm not looking at you. I'm going to sit over here and look at my shoes. Shall we try and look at some of these? Okay, can you hold up any touch drawings? Let's see. Ah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, okay. Interesting, yes. Okay. Let me see what you giggled about over here. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. That's like, how do you do? Wow. It's a scary eyeball, isn't it? It looks like S stitches. Yeah. No, it is. And actually, those are probably your eyelashes, I guess. That's really cool. 
it helps you kind of like actually sort of see different things, doesn't it? Because you wouldn't, you know, you just kind of then get really aware of the. We don't look at eyelashes too often unless we're like a teenager. <laughs> huh? Anything to. How do you do? Oh, yes. Okay. So feeling. Yeah. Different. Yes. Sensitive and nice. Okay. Anything else? Anybody want to show me anything else over here? Okay. Okay, so um, there was a time that I was doing some drawings uh, just directly on the studio wall, and I was actually, I was using, I was looking at somebody at that point, but um, I was just doing quite big. So we're actually doing kind of small right now, which is, you know, if you gave your whole arm, uh, you know, if you had a lot more space, it would be interesting. Or, for example, if you had a pencil on the edge of a, a, of a stick. You know, you'd be doing different things. But anyhow, I had a whole wall, and I was just drawing without looking. And what I did was I put a little um, piece of blue tack. So if I needed to get back to some place, I could locate it. And also I had a sense, like if I was drawing down low or up, I, I could kind of tell where I, where I was. Um, I guess because my feet were in the same place. But I think that these, these ways, when you kind of challenge the normal ways that you look and experience, well, at least I find that I notice, I look and experience different things. And I wonder if, if, if you've experienced a little bit of that. Was there anything that kind of surprised you about, you know, either what you were looking or feeling or experiencing or, or the marks that you were making? Is there anything that anybody would like to to share about that. Yes. I found yeah. it about space in a different way, in the sense of like, I had my hand over my eye and I could feel the like, enclave of like my eye socket. And I want like, with these like cheeks and like, you know, and I mm. Okay, so that's interesting. Um, for the benefit of those at home, she was saying that she felt, first of all, the, the like with a sense of the eye, that the this the space, the space behind it, the space of the eye, and also like a real she couldn't avoid the bones there. We, we're not we don't usually look at people and see their bones. I do because I'm a sculptor and I'm really interested in bones. But um, but but you become more aware of different things. Um, so just it's drawing your attention. And so if you think back to this, the first bit when I told you, I, I kind of lumped a whole lot of instructions on you, and I said just don't look at the, the nose. You know, if you if you concentrate on an object and start drawing it, you miss every. You can ten. I do. If I if I concentrate on this, I just totally miss everything else. There's that study where they did the. Um, What's that? Uh, the gorilla? In the, has anybody seen this psychological study about the gorilla in the room where you're supposed to watch and count the, how many times persons are uh, bouncing the ball up and down? In the middle of it, this gorilla comes by. And, and everybody, you know, nobody sees the gorilla, okay, because we're concentrating on this bit. So that happens when we're drawing. We look at one thing and forget, you know, don't notice other things. But there's also this sense of seeing behind. Um, Sing into um, and, and and some of the artists that I were mentioning try and try and think about that and then conceptually if we you know when you're talking again about fashion you know what what can we see beyond this superficial what can you see beyond the object what can you see be into the materials can we see into the histories can we see into the the kind of conversations be that that are beyond that um, so let's see I don't know if I have I think probably we Probably my, oh, do we have any, um, ah, right, let's just take a look here. Are, they, are these touch drawings? Yeah, okay. So, you know, the kind of interesting thing again here is that you're getting a different sense, like you have a sense here with, that people are lingering more on places. So like if you're drawing, you're going around drawing an outline, you tend to kind of like, okay, I did the eye and go, but if you're feeling it, you're just like, actually, you know, how does that work? You know, what does that, what does that do? Oh, what are all these little things? So it draws your attention, and so you get more of this 
lingering effect, but also, and, and somehow then, well, again, we're not looking at, at the paper, but suddenly proportions don't matter, but why should they matter? Um, you know, it's, it's actually, if we think of um, drawings as kind of a map of what we're experiencing, I don't know, we don't really, it, because we take photographs nowadays, we think that we see in a certain way. Um, but if I'm making um, a sculpture with, with steel lines, the way we, we look at, say, say I've made, I used to make like cows and llamas and stuff like that. So if I made a cow and it's, of, it's like a big tangled drawing, when we see it, we focus on the front bit so we can see the shape of the cow because the way our eye looks is either we're focusing here or there. If I take a picture of it, it collapses it all. Okay, it, it collapses all into one thing. We see everything at once, and then you can't really see the form in the same way. So we think we see like what our what our photograph what what our cameras photographs, but that's not how we experience reality. If I'm looking at you, I have no idea what she's doing over there, um, because I mean, like you could wave your arm, and I might then think to look. But you know, if you were, you know, sort of like I don't know doing something else, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't notice depending on how good my person, you know, well, actually, if you were saying something really interesting, I wouldn't notice. If you, if you got really boring, then I might start noticing even if I was looking at you. So it, it really just depends on where we're bringing our attention or I might be looking at you and nodding as though I was understanding, but really I'm listening in on this fascinating conversation over here behind me. So, um, I don't know if there's anything else that I wanted to just, mentioned well I think actually maybe we'll just uh, we could go on there's so many other fun things and maybe if there's one thing that I'd like to kind of leave you with is um, do you know I always 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 for years and decades have thought I'd really love to have a daily drawing practice and I never ever managed to do this um, and this bothers me a lot, um, but um, I, do, I do do a writing daily, and that's my kind of, uh, but in, and then, you know, drawing will get into it, but, you know, but the, but the, the types of materials that, that one might use can be very um, important, so, like, I would use, I like ballpoint pens, I like pens, I like pencils, I hate charcoal, it's so smudgy, a lot of people really love charcoal, I love... I use objects, I, I draw with objects, so I, I kind of do a, a workshop where we just take a bunch of materials and use that as, uh, you know, our way of composing and, and moving things. The sounds that I brought, you know, in, in, uh, included, so I, I get really interested in, you know, these sounds, and I think about those and think, okay, what is that, what is that quality, what does that tell me? I don't know if people, I don't know, like when you're walking down the street, if you, if you, I don't know, if you wear headphones, do you feel like your balance is as good? You know, there's all, all these sorts of ways and all these senses are really interconnected. Um, I probably should stop because otherwise I'll just keep sort of extrapolating in bad ways. <laughs> so, um. in, in which case, thank you very much, <laughs> Melissa, for, okay. um, for, for, for a brilliant talk, some brilliant okay. insights. That's probably the most laughter I've heard in this room for a, <laughs> certainly a very, very long time. So that really was absolutely spectacular. Oh, so, so, so thank you. And I hope there's more. And I think you can stay around for a little bit if yes. people uh, yeah. want to chat. Yeah. Um, but then just to finish things off to say, we do lots of other events here at the Intellectual Forum. If this was your first one, we hope you'll come to some more. There's lots of things. They cover a huge range of different things. So just to give you an idea of the next few... Um, next Wednesday, we have Sharish Jeevan talking about running an immersive workshop for aspiring leaders. Uh, whether, you know, wherever you are, how do you go about leadership? Then on the 24th, we're looking at infrastructure and time and what future should we be trying to build with a wonderful Shoshana Sachs. And I say wonderful partly because she sat just over there. Um, then we have, uh, on the 28th, we have an evening with Lem Sisse, the poet, who uh, many of you will know. Uh, on the 1st of November, we have Pakistan's former ambassador to the UN in Geneva coming to talk about geopolitics. And that just, there's more in November. So I hope that gives you a sense of the sorts of things that we do. And I hope that you'll be back. 
Um, there won't always be drawing. There won't always be maybe quite as much fun. But hopefully we'll try and meet this. Um, but it's been lovely to have you with us online or in person. Do stay. If you're here for real, do come for a drink as well if you'd like. Thanks a lot, Melissa. It's been yeah. Thank you. And do please get in touch. Um, you can find me online, um, my website, Instagram. It's lovely. I really love your engagement. I love to hear feedback. If you've got great things to say, you can say it to my face. If it's more critical, I'm very also happy to hear about that. Maybe give me a couple days to sort of, you know. So. No, but it's really, really nice. I really appreciate your coming and your contributions. So thank you.